Welcome. Welcome to St. Oswald's Church this morning and our service of morning prayer. If you don't know the church, St. Oswald's is one of the glories of Derbyshire, dedicated in 1241 with the most beautiful spire, referred to by George Eliot as the finest single spire in the whole of England. St. Oswald's has been open for prayer and worship since early July, but we've also maintained an online service right the way through the year. So thank you for Tony and for all those people that have helped that to happen. And that's why I'm so glad you're able to join with us here this morning. Wherever you are, we value your support, either financially or through prayer, as we guide our churches out of lockdown into whatever God's future holds for us. The excitement this week, and I didn't think I'd ever hear myself saying this, is that we've been told that it's safe to leave the heating on during our Sunday services. No more hot water bottles underneath the cassock. So with that good news, let's turn to our service this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Our first hymn this morning. So Paul wrote these words to the church of Philippi. Beloved, the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us hold fast to what we have attained. Let's pray. Father God, as we journey home to you, 
and face the challenges and changes of life on the way. Send your Holy Spirit among us now, that together we may grow in faith, hope and love, united to him who is the way, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings to us so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and protector of our faith. Let's together confess our sins to God in penitence and in faith, saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Benighty. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have moulded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. The Collect, the Church's Prayer for this, the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. The reading is taken from St Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. As he brings his letter to a close, Paul urges the two women who had worked with him in Philippi to settle their differences for the sake of the unity of the church congregation. He finishes his letter on a joyful note. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the Gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, 
whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. If you're able to, would you like to stand for the Gospel? In the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find there to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets, and gathered all that they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be neat weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our sermon this morning comes courtesy of Reverend Nigel. I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That reading from the Gospel according to Matthew is an account of a conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. That's where we see Jesus using a parable, a metaphorical story, to illustrate his point. Jesus was using a familiar wedding custom at the time to teach an important lesson. But it is a parable that often bothers people, because it doesn't say what we want it to say. We want to hear a nice story about God throwing the wedding party open to everyone. As people now fashionably say, we want it to be inclusive. So let everyone come, unconditionally. It is uncomfortable to hear about judgment. That is what this parable teaches. The custom in Jesus' day, at the time of a marriage engagement, an announcement was sent to the bridegroom's friends to inform them of the forthcoming wedding and to invite them to attend the wedding feast that would follow. It was usual to leave about 12 months between the engagement and the wedding itself, so the invited guests had ample time to prepare themselves for attending the wedding banquet. By way of illustration, Jesus tells the story of a king, the father of the bridegroom, who reminded the friends of his son's wedding feast. In the story, the invited guests represent the Jewish leaders of that time. The king, of course, is God, and the bridegroom, the king's son, is Jesus. So the story goes. King's messengers were sent to call for a second and a third time on those who had been invited to the wedding feast. But they continued to reject the invitation, even mistreating and killing the king's messengers. They were blind to the special invitation they had been given and didn't see the need to make a response. They were clearly showing contempt for the king 
and the invitation. The wedding guests had been invited at least three times, representing God's repeated and patient attempts through the prophets to call his people back to him. But the guests rejected those offers, and so rejected God himself. The king was angry, angry with those who failed to respond. So he destroyed those wicked men and burned their city, which is what peeved kings did in those days. Fortunately, that was not the end of the story. The king really wanted people to celebrate his son's wedding. So he sent his servants out again, this time to invite as many people as they could find. We don't have to look far in Matthew's Gospel to see who they were. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the riffraff, the nobodies, the blind and the lame, the people who thought they had been forgotten. Now, I can imagine that the crowds listening to the story would have thought this to be scandalous, because they would have been taught that God was only interested in religious people, people who have made an effort to live decent, honest lives, people who didn't have any checkered history or dubious past. But the king welcomed everyone, both good and bad, and that is what God still does today. None of us are perfect, but his generous invitation to life with him still stands. And he accepts us as we are. But when the blind and lame came to Jesus, he didn't say, you are all right as you are. He healed them. When the prostitutes and extortioners came, he didn't say, you're all right as you are. His love reached them where they were. But his love refused to let them stay as they were. Their lives were transformed, healed, changed. Actually, I don't think that anyone really believes that God wants everyone to stay exactly as they are. And that is the point of the end of the story, which otherwise is very puzzling. If the servants had just collected all these folk together, how did they have the time or even the means to obtain or change into wedding costume? Why should this one man be thrown out because he didn't have the right thing to wear? Isn't that just the sort of social exclusion that the gospel rejects? Well, yes, of course, at that level. But that's not how parables work. The point of the story is that Jesus is telling the truth. The truth that the political and religious leaders like to keep hidden. The truth that God's kingdom is a kingdom in which love, justice, truth, mercy and holiness reign. And they are the clothes that you need to wear for the wedding. If you refuse to put them on, you are saying that you don't want to stay at the party. Rejecting God just as much as if you had not even accepted the invitation in the first place. Now this parable is not just an interesting story that Jesus told 2,000 years ago that is meant for other people. It is a description of how God is calling each and every one of us to share in the life of his kingdom. To experience the love, the joy, the peace, the forgiveness through believing in his son, Jesus. So let us not hesitate to don the wedding costume, accept the invitation to be renewed and fully participate 
in celebrating the love, joy, peace and forgiveness of that wedding feast in God's kingdom. Amen. As we stand, let us declare our faith in our God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. We turn to our prayers. Let us pray for the church and for the world, and thank God for his goodness. Let us pray. In loving confidence, let us bring before the Lord all the needs of the human family. Let us pray for the Church, the beloved vineyard of God, for Archbishop Justin, for Libby, our bishop, and her vision that our diocese might seek first the kingdom of God. For Duncan and all our ministers locally, that the church may produce fruits to God's glory and live in the spirit of unity, truth and concord. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. Let us pray for the world, for a flourishing of forgiveness, mercy and justice in our society for peace among the nations of the world, for the development of a vaccine for the virus, and for a greater sense of our global responsibilities. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. Let us pray for all who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity praying that the Lord in his goodness will comfort and succour them. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. We give thanks for our fellowship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St John the Baptist, St Peter, St Oswald, St Barlock, and all the Holy Ones of God. In a moment of silence, and uniting our prayers with the whole company of the saints and angels, we bring our common concerns before God, our communities, our places of work and leisure, and our schools. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear, hear us. God, the creator and giver of life, hear the prayers of your people. Transform us in your love, that your kingdom may grow in our midst. Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We conclude our prayers with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this week.
Thank you. Thank you for joining with us for our morning service. So this week, please take care, stay safe, and we'll see you again next Sunday. Concluding words for our service this morning from St. Columba. Lord, be thou a bright flame before me. Be thou a guardian star above me. Be thou a smooth path beneath me. Be thou a kindly shepherd behind me. Today, tonight, and forever. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and upon those for whom you pray this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.